So this will be my second Camino experience. I did the Portuguese Camino, the inland way, two years ago, around about the same time. Traditionally, pilgrims coming from England or Ireland would arrive on ship in Ferrol or A Coruña, and they would start their overland journey down to Santiago de Compostela. So it's about 120 kilometers, and from my readings, people do it over about four to six days. And I think it starts here at the Cathedral of Ferrol. I feel a little bit more settled now. I've just gone and picked up my credentials of the pilgrimage. You can do the pilgrimage as a walker, as I'm doing, or a cyclist, or on horseback. Or there's an option as well to do it on boat or on wheelchair. So five or so minutes from the cathedral is kilometer zero. And there's almost like a tourist information here. Well, the weather's awesome. It's pretty cool and windy. I'd say it's about 15 degrees. Nice coastal wind. So first steps on the Camino here. We'll see how far we get today following the yellow brick road. I'll pick myself up one of the main symbols of the Camino, the scallop shell or the cockle shell. You'll see pilgrims wear this. This will mark them as a pilgrim on the way or the Camino on the back of their backpacks. But why the cockle shell? Well, it's supposedly because it's simply abundant on the northwest coast of Spain where this pilgrimage culminates right up in the area of Galicia in the city of Santiago de Compostela. The arrow said right, but I didn't know if that meant right or it meant straight. It meant straight. This looked more scenic, but the track runs out back up the hill. I haven't seen any other pilgrims yet. I guess it's because I started quite late in the day. Just entered into an area that's full of eucalypt trees. So it smells just like home. The Galician octopus here. I'll have to try that later. The Pulpo a la gallega. Just here at the 100 kilometer mark, just seen my first fellow pilgrims. Not up for it. I think I've just got to nether. So I'm just pausing briefly under this giant magnolia tree. And I guess this is the crossroads. It's either stay here or push on. So in the little guide that I picked up from the tourist information office in Ferrol, they suggest this would make a good day one. So that breaks it up over six days, but I've got five days to do this. So I've got to catch up a day at some stage. So today is going to be the day. So it looks like another 13 to 15 kilometers to a place called Ponte de Ume. Yeah. <laughs> 
good timing. I've just hit a little town. So I think I've got another 10 kilometers or so to get to where I'm heading. And I'm so itchy. <laughs> I'm so sweaty and oh, the backpack is driving me nuts. I think I need some antihistamines or something. But I've got this little menu of the tortilla and the coffee. Little chalkboard here saying, write your name down. It's been a nice section of the walk. I've just crossed underneath this big viaduct. This guy's here having a feed. This is my destination for today, Puente Duerme. I've read that with pilgrimage has to come some discomfort and suffering. Certainly on my first Camino, I had ill-fitting shoes and yeah, lots of blisters. But for me today, I've just been so crazy itchy. There must be something in the air, but I just found a pharmacy and got some antihistamines. Beautiful town that I'm coming into now, here on the water with the boat, sun setting. It's almost nine o'clock, so the days are very, very long. Apparently tomorrow it's about 25 k's and takes about five hours. So lots of uphill in the morning and then it relaxes after that. But that'll be good. Hopefully I'll get a bit of a earlier start to tomorrow. Starting day two here on the Camino Inglés. So I stayed in this little pension last night. So I paid 20 euros for this little private room with a bed and a shower. <laughs> I'm in this pretty little square and I was spoiled for choice for cafes this morning for a little bite to eat and a coffee. And I intentionally chose this place because it was the most quiet. I had a little bit of work to do and I was able to find a table inside. And then within five minutes, the keg delivery arrived and then they had an ice cream machine installed and it was all happening, clanging plates, loud conversations, barking instructions, very, very Spanish and I feel all the more anxious for it. All right, away we go. Just noticed here the Correos, the post office, is collecting some luggage. You can have your bag taken from accommodation to accommodation, make the walk a little bit easier and more comfortable.
think I've only done about eight, nine Ks this morning, but this came at the right time. I was getting really, really hungry. So there's this great cafe in here, and I've got a tuna empanada, and this is a cheesecake. <laughs> so a bit indulgent for this time of day, but you don't feel guilty when you're doing all of these Ks. So the music playing is the Gallegan music, and it's very Celtic. So it's strongly influenced by the Celts up in this part of Spain. How beautiful is this though, down by the water? Looks a bit like a home. Big, long hill. Gracias. Ah, oh, bien. Es un video. <laughs> sí. Hola. Quiero Hola. decir gracias. ¿Cómo se llama la parada de Los Ángeles? Eh, Monte del Viento, Los Ángeles del Camino. <laughs> and they've been here since 2017. And this couple comes every day between March and October. March uh -huh. and October. Uh -huh. You have waters and <laughs> drinks and stamps and have a chat with everyone, so it's very nice. Gracias. <laughs> Gracias. Okay, Ven hasta camino. la próxima. Ciao. Dalia, ven. Dalia. Su nombre es Dalia. Dalia. <laughs> Eres buena y la tengo suelta. <laughs> Ciao, Dalia. Just arrived in the town of Betanzos. So today was about 21, 22 Ks. Looks like they've just had a medieval festival here. My eyes are so red. All these allergens are really getting to me. So a unique opportunity just to show you quickly what the albergue dormitory rooms look like. So every one of these is distinct, has its own characteristics. There was a big room downstairs that was absolutely full of people. And it looks like most beds are taken in this one as well, but it just happens that most people are out and about. So upon check-in, they give you these very rustic sheets. And so they just ask that you leave your boots outside of the rooms. And there's a few, a few Signs up just saying, please no eating in beds and to make sure that you throw your sheets out in the morning. Day three on the English Camino. I'm leaving Betanzos and I don't know where I'll end up today. Quite a typical albergue experience this morning. So a lot of the alarms went off in unison. Lots of rustling of plastic bags and going off in whispers that went up and got louder. And then full on conversations and lights being flicked on. <laughs> That's silvery green is the 
young saplings of the Tasmanian blue gum. So touching it up close, it's really rubbery. I thought it would be crispier. <laughs> but up here, it's a real blessing for very few and a curse to many. So they're so aggressive in the way that they just pop up everywhere and where the gum tree grows, it doesn't leave space for the native trees. We've got 10 k's in this morning, a little less. I've just stopped in Bar Carabel. I'm gonna have a tostada here. So we've got some ham and cheese and coffee on the way. Pilgrims are coming in waves now. <laughs> Sometimes those cafes has this snowball effect because they're talking over each other but to be able to hear themselves they're talking louder and then the other per person's talking louder and louder and it just crescendos into this chaos so i just charged up with a tostada and a coffee and away we go so i was sitting with the spanish girl just now and i asked how her morning was and she said her head was thumping because in the albergue where she stayed last night there was lots of snorers she said she's feeling it today <laughs> These hydrangeas are everywhere on the Camino Inglés. They're amazing. This is a fun lunch stop for today. Lots of pilgrims stopping here. So they had a set menu of either pasta or caldo gallego, a Galician style soup, and chicken or pork. It's the longest, flattest stretch I've had on the Camino so far. I think that was a kilometer without even a little turn. day four here on the Camino Inglés and I stayed at this nice albergue last night. It's much quieter than the one from the night before. Got some washing done and then went to get something to eat but there's no food places around. Other travellers were just much more prepared than I was and they already had their food. I was so tired, I just went hungry. It just didn't bother me that much. I'd had enough throughout the day but something to be aware of and prepared for. I've just met a fellow Aussie traveler this morning, lancing his blisters and doing a bit of mid-morning surgery. Seems to be pretty common practice here on the Camino. Wouldn't be Galicia without some rain. So it's just a soft mist this morning. And today I'm heading to Santiago de Compostela. So it's about, oh, I've got to start my tracker. I've got about 30 Ks ahead of me. Here's what caught me out last night. I'd read that there was this food place close by, but it's only open from one to four. Maybe there's just not enough foot traffic for them to open all the time. Here we go, up the hill, let's go. 
So last night I stayed at one of the municipal albergues, but talking to that fella, that fellow Australian this morning, he'd actually planned to stop in, I think it's called Bruma, about eight k's prior, but it was full. And when all the space is taken up in the inn, so to speak, you gotta march on. These places don't take reservations either, so it's first come, first served. There are other places where you can call up and reserve in advance, like guest houses, hotels and hostels. Huge. This is a nice idea. At this little cafe, they've got some post-it notes where you can scribble down a note and pin it up amongst all of the others on the wall. And then on the 12th of March every year, they put them in these containers. I've already written one, but I can't find it. <laughs> I've really lost it. Where's it gone? There it is. Just came across this Aussie fella who stayed at the albergue last night. Again, and he's got this really lovely sort of vulnerable naivety to him. He's really energized, he's chatting with everyone, he's asking people where they're from, and, and I don't say that with any sense of cynicism. Mine is a different Camino experience. I'm trying to sort of block the world out a little bit. I guess that speaks of how the Camino is different for absolutely everyone. So traditionally this was done by pilgrims, by devotees, maybe seeking forgiveness, maybe displaying their incredible devotion and beliefs. But nowadays people do it for any multitude of reasons. They might be doing it for spiritual reasons. They might be doing it because it's a bucket list item. Maybe they're grieving. Maybe they're quitting something. Maybe they're gaining something. There's others certainly, and I fit into this category, where it's just a really nice travel experience. It's a walk. It has history. You're walking in the footsteps of many thousands of people before you. There's also great satisfaction in it. It has build, it has crescendo, it has the journey, and you get those tangible stamps along the way. So there's something sort of visually satisfying. This is the world's biggest slug I'm looking at. Nice little snack. Empanada de chorizo, different types of meat. These were hiding in this tin. Just arrived in Seguero. So it's another 10 miles or 15, 16 kilometers to get to Santiago. This is a common stopping off point before people make their final push tomorrow. Just with my work schedule, I'm gonna continue on today. The closer you get to Santiago, the more pilgrims seem to bottleneck as the paths converge. It's more click clacking of hiking sticks on the ground. Lots more backpacks piled up the front of cafes. There's this real momentum that grabs you. It's a little bit like a riptide, a current, and you just feel pulsed along. 
Just had a really nice, albeit brief chat with this Australian fella. He was asking me if I'd had any introspective moments on the Camino. And we're kind of just swapping some stories about why we were on the way. He spoke a little bit about sacrifice and wanting to have that pilgrim's experience. He used the word suffering and then he backtracked on, on it a little bit. He said, not suffering, but maybe denial of that extra beer or that extra pastry. But I understood what he meant. This is octopus with a bit of sea salt and paprika. Lots of olive oil too. It's had a nice lunch at this place called Pulparilla Maison Asturias. And had the traditional pulpo a la gallega, the Galician style octopus. And some pork and fries. Had a coffee. Made me really tired. I had a moment in there where I started looking online for local hotels. This has been the first cafe, bar, restaurant, albergue, pension, where I haven't been able to get a stamp so far. The lady was apologetic, but said that they had a really pretty stamp and that someone took it with them. Here's a couple of older examples of these Galician Oreos. You also see them in Asturias and I've passed them in the north of Portugal too. But they are a traditional way of storing your grain, keeping it above ground, away from the moisture and the cold, and even away from some rodents. And a lot of them are stone and look like they're from another era. But even walking past some of the big manor houses that have been recently constructed, they've also got these oreos. Maybe it's a call back to another time in history. This last two hours has been really hot and with very, very few shady areas. And I ran out of water ages ago. There's just been nowhere to fill it up. Just found somewhere. So it said that travelers started coming here in about the 830s when the body of St. James was discovered up here in the Galician fields. The discovery of the relics or the bones of St. James came at a really temperamental time in Spain as we know its history. So 120 years prior, the Moors, the Northern African Islamic people, had come across the Strait of Gibraltar and they had swept across the entire Iberian Peninsula. This day is taking forever. So it is said by legend that the relics or the bones of St. James were discovered by a hermit living in the fields of Galicia and he was guided to this field by this sky full of stars. The hermit went on to report this to a bishop called Theodoma of a city called Iria Flavia. It was decided that they would build a shrine on this spot. But how did the body get there? James the Elder, one of the disciples of Jesus, was killed by King Herod in about the year 62. And one night, his body was placed into a stone boat, I think to add to the miraculous nature of the story. And without rudder nor steersman, pushed out, eventually finding its way from the eastern Mediterranean, through the Med, through the thin and tumultuous strait of Gibraltar and then going against the trade winds north up the Atlantic and finding safe passage and rest in the Rias or the fjords of Galicia only to be discovered about 800 years later. Well you can make your own mind up about the authenticity of the story but the result was the same. The story of the bones of St. James being up in this northwest corner of Spain brought pilgrims. This was medieval Europe. It wasn't a concept, it was a reality. You can come from anywhere, but the result's the same. It all funnels like lines in a delta, like little rivulets back to this one city. And it was like a drip of Christianity.
which became a puddle, which became a stream, which became a river and onto a raging torrent. And it was emblematic of the crossing of political powers and religions in this almost 800 year battle that the Christians called the Reconquista, the reconquering of Christian Spain. The Reconquista was aided by the many Christian pilgrims that were making their way to Santiago de Compostela. They brought money, they brought infrastructure, it brought architectural styles, it brought touristic sites which drew more and more pilgrims along the many ways. But most significant of all, it brought Christian knights and soldiers to fight for the Christian kingdoms against the Moors of the south. Well, no, I mean, it was a bit challenging. There's so many pilgrims. This is pretty cool, actually. Well, it took me all day in the end, but I've just arrived in the main square of Santiago. There was this guy just on his knees. I thought he was proposing. He just couldn't get up. His knees were so sore. Just got to the main square. I was just in the post office sending my little niece Murdy a postcard and a fellow Australian gifted me this shell because they were concerned that it wouldn't get through customs. So it's like all these little rivulets, all of these different ways, whichever way that you choose to take, wherever you start your journey, all roads in this case lead here to the Gothic Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. I've got the tuna band playing here with lovely acoustics underneath the arches in front of the cathedral here. Well, thanks for coming along on the Camino Inglés. The whole idea of this was just to share the experience so people could see who aren't able to do it currently, what it's like, what the days look like, some of the styles of the accommodation and some of the story of why tens of thousands of people do this every year and have been doing so for over a thousand years. Camino Inglés is one of the shorter Caminos that you can do by still achieving your Compostela. So the minimum you need to do is 100 kilometers. So this one just gets over the line with 113 kilometers. Thanks for joining. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you on the next one.